New Thinking Aloud is presented by the California Institute for Human Science, Mind Body Spirit University, a leader in fully accredited in person and online U.S. college degree programs in many of the topics we cover here. Visit their website at cihs.edu. Thinking Aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Emmy Vadness, co-host with Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be discussing an easy way for you to read your astrological birth chart with my guest Allison Chester Lambert, who has a master's degree in cultural astronomy, astrology, and mythology. She was the founder of UK's Midland School of Astrology and a former resident astrologer for a daily BBC TV news show. Allison is author of Starry Messengers, Future in the Stars, and The Easy Way to Learn Astrology, How to Read Your Birth Chart. Allison has also created astrology reading cards and Greek mythology reading cards. This is Allison's third interview on New Thinking Aloud, and if you enjoy this program, please like, subscribe, press the bell icon, and share. She's joining us from Leicestershire, England. Now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Allison. It's a great joy to have you back with us on New Thinking Aloud today. Oh, thank you so much. I can't believe that the three have already just flown by. <laughs> it's been such fun. Thank you. You're very welcome. I've enjoyed everything you've shared so far. In our first two interviews, and I'll link to them in the upper right corner of the screen, we discussed cultural astronomy and getting more information about the dwarf planets. Today, we're going to go deeper into astrology and help people understand their birth chart. Could you share with us to get us started? What is a birth chart in astrology? That is such a great question. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been asked that question. <laughs> and honestly, yeah, that's a really important question as well. And yeah, the, the answer is quite complex, but I'll try and make it easy. Um, I think the best way to describe um, the invisible forces which make astrology such a valid practice is electromagnetic field lines. I think that's the best way to do it. And um, we're understanding more and more at the moment how electrical field um, and that kind of, of force and, um, and generation is making a huge, has always made and will continue to make a huge impact on the surface of the earth. Now, I remember years ago when somebody said, oh, the sun, how, how could the sun possibly impact the Earth? Now, um, and especially just recently, if you saw spaceweather.com, there was a big report about um, the huge geomag geomagnetic storm that we had in May. And they have now got the graphs proving the massive impact that it has when the magnetic field lines are filled with the extra energy, I'll put it like that, and it comes down to Earth. It depletes cosmic rays to a great degree. It does an enormous thing. So that filters down to the surface of the Earth. There's no way that electricity stays up there and says, no, I'm not going down to that Earth. There's no way. <laughs> it comes down. It filters down through lightning. It filters down just through the ordinary layers of the atmosphere. Let's take a baby being born on one square meter of Earth, right? Now, Earth, the Earth, our sphere is, is quite complex because it is round and it's not flat. Um, but we have coordinates. Um, and so that means we can identify every single meter all over the planet. Great. Each of those meters has its own individual electromagnetic field line, very subtle. But this is recognized by nature, the birds, snails read it, um, beetles read it. 
So we know the that there is a force and that it is real and it does have an impact on our bodies, on our sensitive nervous systems. Um, every cell in our body has a weak electrical pulse. So, you know, this has all got to interact with the outer, outer environment. Now, animals seem to be absolutely fine with this. You know, they, they say, hey, let's fly to the Arctic. Everybody on board, right off we go. And they know they're going to get to the Arctic. I think we're the only species on this planet that actually doesn't know how to use or identify these field lines. Anyway, baby is born with the exact time and the exact place. It has its own individual blueprint, shall we say. So these field lines converted into the map of astrology, which simply shows the planets in the sky, the planets on the other side of the earth, the horizon and the highest point of the sky. So this is the map of of, of where they're born. This this baby is born and nobody else can have the same birth chart. Nobody unless another baby is born on top of the one that is being born. Even if you're two meters away, even if you're 20 seconds apart like twins, because the Earth is moving so fast, although it doesn't feel like it, um, because the Earth is moving so fast, it changes that chart, such as the sensitivity and the really fine identification um, in that chart. So that chart is then made up of something called the zodiac belt, which is an imaginary line around the Earth with the 12 zodiac signs. And after that, it is made up of something called houses, which is a way of describing exactly where that baby is born to the square meter. Now, I've got one here and I'm going to hold it up. I know we, you know, you can probably put this up another way, but these these things here are houses and and that kind of pinpoints the exact place. The interaction between the zodiac belt, so the incoming data, if you like, and the houses which describe the places of our life. So this is where we communicate. This is where we're educated. This is where we meet a significant other. This is where we go to work. That's it. That's all we need for a birth chart. Now, this is going to surprise everybody and then I'll switch off. We don't need planets. We don't actually need planets to read that relationship between the houses and the zodiac belt. I want to get to the piece about why we don't need planets in just a moment. Before we get there, why do you think it's beneficial for us to understand our birth chart? Because it's the best possible way and the quickest possible way that I know of, of understanding yourself. Um, and there's been many research things done about what makes people uncomfortable and happy, depressed. I mean, everybody, you know, if we could find the answer to this and sort of make it into an elixir, I imagine. Um, so there's, there's a lot of research done into what makes people unhappy. And it's understanding. Understanding and meaning come out top. Astrology gives us an understanding it says, OK, um, why is it that I can't seem to get very far at school, that the teacher calls me a dunce, that all my, my fellow students seem to be able to learn something far faster than me? I'm stupid. I, I must be stupid. I, And then in comes all the depression and the lowering of confidence that we get at school when we're not achieving. And if we had... Um, an astrology chart and if we could understand the basics we could look at the place in the chart where it describes our education and if we saw there for instance Pisces um, then we could go oh because this is slowing down our ability to pick up and memorize things so that the huge Piscean waters tend to dissolve boundaries, not help us keep them. So you could look at that and go, oh, I'm a slow learner. 
oh, okay, well, maybe I, I'm not so, so you know, <laughs> lacking in IQ after all. And you, you maybe the, the parent looking at it, or maybe even the child themselves, if they get to 16 and they're looking at it, could go, excuse me, has anybody ever tested me for this? I appear to be a very slow learner. Now, it's not that I'm not intelligent, I have a higher IQ, but I, I'm slow in learning. Now, if you understood that and you were able to flag that up, excuse me, miss, I'm just slow in learning and it says so here. And if miss also believed in astrology and went, oh, oh, OK, yeah, I get that. OK, well, you need more time or you need more visual cues or something like that. So I've just taken a small example there, but that's why I feel it's important. The more we can understand ourselves, the better our lives can be. I think so. It doesn't mean that we're going to get a quick fix. What it means is we've got the signposts. As I was saying, you know, we could have various things that convince us that other people seem to be getting on so much better and, and they seem to be achieving in this particular way. Let's say organization, right? <laughs> How often do you you lose your keys? How often do they lose their keys? This or, or phones or something. Um, I think it's if we can identify where we have got a deficit um, and we can learn to work with it. Now, it's not going to make it any easier. In fact, we've probably given ourselves some more work because we can look at this and go, OK, I am likely to lose my phone and my keys. Right. It says so here in the sixth house. OK, so I know maybe and these days we can do this. We can buy one of those little things that go onto the key ring or go onto the phone and then you walk into a room and you whistle and it answers you or has a tracker in or something like that. Now, OK, we've had to do a bit extra work there, but we have saved ourselves, maybe as long as it's within earshot, um, you know, some <laughs> some heartbreaking times of ransacking the house and thinking, why is it always me? <laughs> People can understand from their birth chart, for example, what kind of family or lineage um, might impact us, what we might aspire to do in life, right. the partners we might seek things. out. Absolutely. And um, we can pick out hereditary factors, the inheritance, if you like. Um, and, and you could say, oh, well, you want to be a nurse because your mom was a nurse or your dad was a nurse. Um, and, well, that would be quite true, <laughs> really, because that's the influence. Um, and, you know, you aspire to what your parent does and it seems to be very fulfilling and, you know, it's a much appreciated vocation. So, yes, you want to tread in their steps. Um, but astrology will show that through repetition um, of zodiac signs on houses or something like that. And. It, it, it can also be used to go back through generations and you might be able to identify certain patterns. Um, and in that case, um, you know, that that can be useful. Um, I don't know if I, I don't know why it's useful to say, oh, well, you know, this has been in my family for generations. But don't we love to blame something or hold something up, you know, and as if it's not all me. This is why. Here's my excuse. Here's the reason I am the way I am. <laughs> That's right. And it, I think it does help people. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I, I get that. <laughs> right. Before we go deeper into these ways of how to read the birth chart in a very simplified version that you present in your, your latest book, what do you say to folks when they say, oh, astrology is rubbish or the signs and constellations are not where they were when astrology was first created by the ancients and so forth? I get that a lot. Um, in fact, I've been doing this 30 years and I think I've been doing interviews for about 20 of those years. Um, and you will be amazed how many radio presenters um, or even TV presenters start with, so you believe in astrology, huh? It's like, 
no, I just decided to throw my life away. <laughs> this, <laughs> this subject that has no basis. <laughs> What I tend to say, this, the first thing I'm able to say, I, I always go, you know, I've read, I, I, I know loads and loads of, of people who have studied astrology and believe it to be useful and believe it to have credibility. Now, I don't know anybody who has studied astrology and still says it's a load of rubbish. So what I would suggest is that those people should, first of all, study a subject before they decide that it is unhelpful, impossible, not useful. Um, and I think then we would have uh, a lot more credibility for astrology out there. Inherent to astrology is that it's very individualistic as far as how it's helping a person. So as far as research studies and scientific ways to prove validity, that really may not exactly apply because there are so many variables that makes one unique. I think you're right. I think you're right in saying that. But I think we have generalizations also. Um, so it's a very complex subject. So we've got easy bits and we've got complex bits. And <laughs> so uh, uh, there is complexity. Reading it it can be confusing because there are so many rules that can be broken. It's like learning a language um, or learning how to spell English. You know, I before E except after C. So um, we, we could, I could go there with that kind of complexity. However, um, I nevertheless think that properly understood um, and coming from a reader who has the sensitivity and the deep inside knowledge of astrology, I think that that reading can be partly led by the chart in front, but also partly led by a conversation between the reader and the client. I don't think it's right to just ask the client to sit there and say nothing um, and then just sort of carry on and carry on and carry on. I think that's more kind of psychic, really. I think such is the interpretation potential in a chart that it is always wise to get the client to um, walk along with you so that, you know, you're not completely just blotting things out that might not in this case have worked out the way that you think it did. Yeah. Well, you've written a whole book on how to read the astrology birth chart from what you offer as a more easy perspective. What is unique about the way you share with people they can read their birth chart and how does it differ from other methods of astrology? Okay, so I've taken a big risk with this book. Um, I know that. But it comes from personal experience. I'm a slow learner. Um, and I have it, it takes a, a huge amount of my brain doesn't work like everybody else's. I really have to concentrate. Once I've learned something, I've never forgotten it. But learning it in the first place is very, very hard. And I don't understand why, but I do know I'm a slow learner. It might be something to, to do with dyslexia. I don't know. So when it came to learning astrology, I struggled. In fact, I started two classes and left them because I felt like such a dunce. Um, now, there, was, there is an easier way. Because most people understand the zodiac signs, um, they're, so, they're closely associated with sun signs. People read sun sign columns, horoscopes in, in magazines. Um, because of that association, uh, and so most people know if they're an Aries or a Cancer. And so that is something that's familiar. So if you get that as an opening, then you feel more confident as you walk in. However, most of the astrology schools available when I was learning 30 years ago always started with planets and a very complex um, practice, and that is to, to, to draw up an individual horoscope from scratch. So to use all the geometry for 
saying exactly where that square meter of earth is on the surface of the planet from scratch <laughs> now there are people in nasa that can't do this right there are people there are astronomers that couldn't do it, it and it used to and the, the details of doing it was so painful that it's just so imagine you, you you want to go and learn about something that's going to help you it's going to heal that's going to take pain away that's going to encourage the development of talents and and you'll 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 <laughs> present it with this highly complex chart thing that you've got to learn how to do before they'll let you do anything else or um planets the first thing they do is teach about the planets this is the sun this is the moon right we're going to learn the meaning of the sun and the moon um okay but there's an quite a lot of information that comes with these planets rotation periods around the sun aspects so the distance between one planet and another and that can be from the earth or from the sun it it's quite complex and if you don't know anything about planets before you start then even something like well which planet is closest to the sun <laughs> so, i didn't know i just knew that i understood the meaning that seemed to be coming out of these astrologers they seem to know uh, and understand me um, but what has that got to do with what's the closest planet to the sun so i started to think very deeply about what makes the different astrologers now we have astrologies in plural not astrology there's many many astrologers on a daily basis at the moment i use something called transiting astrology to write a daily blog actually now it's in video form now to record a video every day and slap it on my youtube channel okay um so to do this i am looking at planets only right and i'm writing this from that i can't use houses because i'm not looking at a person so there is not one square meter that is going to provide information about the houses this is entirely about the relationship of the planets to each other uh, and of course the zodiac signs so that's not an of course and the zodiac signs um okay now what's the difference between that and a birth chart well a birth chart a horoscope is static and it identifies the electromagnetic pattern around the baby as it draws its first breath and that's the important thing and um, prospective mothers here um it's not the time of your child's birth that you want to note it's the time it drew a breath <laughs> so <laughs> change everything to do with birth times and people standing there waiting because this astrology is different the birth sign so the the horoscope the birth chart is different it can be done just with those two things with the zodiac sign and the houses and the interaction of those as a starter now, when I was teaching, in the, I used to run a school, the Midlands School of Astrology, before everything went online. What I've understood is that by putting it this way, by doing the zodiac signs first and then the houses, putting the two together and saying, now read that, you know all about Gemini and you know, you all, you know all about the second house, which is your resources um, and the things that will give you security the things you can touch so it's your money income pensions car all this sort of thing so what does it mean to have gemini on that second house around that second house in the same place what does that mean and i have found that, go, that they can go uh well it probably means that um i can't decide um, so I'll, I'll say, oh, I totally want it this way. And then the next week is, no, I don't like that way anymore. I totally want it this way. I'm not going to save in my piggy bank anymore. I'm now going to save by putting money into the account. Um, and I can't really make my mind up. I'm going to do loads of research. I'm going to look it up and I'm going to get all the information I can from building societies and this, that and the other. And when it comes to buying a house, I'm going to drive everybody mad wanting the finest detail about this house. And is it on a bus route? It will give you so much information about something simple like that. Yes, eventually you are going to get to planets. 
and there is a second book and it's it's literally called the planets and i'm writing it at the moment um and by the time people are ready for the planets they will be able to do a really good job with what they've got and it won't have been frightening and it will be easy to understand and it's all about the psychology and not the astronomy or the technical data stuff of and geometry and stuff like that um, and so it's a step in now is the world ready for just a step in learning a different way around not putting planets first putting zodiac signs first and then houses i will let you know in two years yeah <laughs> and so will the publisher <laughs> There are 12 houses, and when a person is born, there is a zodiac sign that occupies each of those houses. And when I was reading your book, you're suggesting that once we understand what the meaning of each of those zodiac signs are, and we understand the meaning of the houses, then we can understand ourselves better. And you present that first, and then you suggest people can learn about planets. Yes, that's correct. That, that for me, is the way to do it because it encourages you to make that first step. It's like most things, isn't it? It's like we can be quite fearful of them. Um, you know, let's, let's take, um, you know, a 16-year-old wants to go backpacking around a strange continent on the moon. And uh, that's all very scary and seems difficult and everything. Um, it's making it easy to make those first steps. So if somebody accompanied her to the moon and said, well, here it is, and this is this, and this, and that's the other, then, okay, I'm not so frightened now, okay. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm in light, not dark. <laughs> so I feel more confident, and off she goes. So it, it's that sort of thing. It's only a first book. Now, I've been, as I'm saying this, it's only a first book. What the comments are showing already is that such is my understanding of the zodiac signs from a psychological perspective and i have a master's degree in this one of my modules um, was actually about the psychological perspectives of astrology and that was taken by dr liz green who is an expert in these matters she was my tutor for many years on and off different uh, schools and what have you I think for that reason that I, I was able and on a regular basis, what I do is I go into those zodiac signs more deeply than and with much more understanding. Maybe this is about the slow learning. Maybe maybe I'm a slow learner because I look at much more detail, much more slowly. Yeah, you go more deeply into it. And yes. then you can be, be more it. thorough with your understanding and then you can bring it back and teach us. Yeah, I don't skim anything. That depth is being understood or being looked at by astrologers who've been doing this for years. And they're going, wow, I've never seen this that way. Wow, I've, I've, I never understood that. That makes so much sense. That's incredible. So I'm thinking about what they're saying, going, this book was intended just to give a starter to people who are wannabe astrologers, have always wanted to, but it's too too difficult. Um, but the actual astrologers, uh, those of those who will read it, because of course we've always got to go, we've always got the ones that get, oh, new planets. No, I'm not. <laughs> um, but the ones that will are going, this is amazing. You're 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 hitting this, absolutely. And it's a lot of the time it's stuff that's not online because it's not online tends to get quite repetitive as everything is copied and pasted. Also, you mentioned that when you were first learning astrology, you were taught to actually draw up your own chart or the chart you were going to be reading. And nowadays, well, for many years, there have been computer programs, you could buy a disc, and now there are online groups or forums, websites where you can easily subscribe or create an account and create your birth chart or the chart you want to explore absolutely and yes you're so right when i learned astrology we we all got on trains and went into the center of london um i went <laughs> computers were the size of rooms 
and you fed them with pieces of paper with holes punched down the side. <laughs> so they, they were no, they were never going to answer back. But um, yeah, no, it's true. So we've moved on. And yes, um, there is uh, one um, pro, uh, program or app uh, called Solar Fire, which basically has the whole market in terms of astrological software. And, and that makes it really easy because now I put in the date, the time, the place, and I push a button and da -da, there's the chart. <laughs> so ah, I could have done with that about 30 years ago. Um, so, yeah, there is that. And, and then websites, there is there is one top website. Uh, it's a European site um, and it beats all the others hands down. It has way more facilities and a lot more um customer friendly than well there isn't any peers actually and that's astro.com and so you can register with astro.com and they will keep a database of, of your charts and give you those charts and interact with those charts for free I what? <laughs> it's like thank you <laughs> so I teamed up with astro.com uh Karen the editor there was brilliant throughout this whole project and she's actually uh, on the book she has written something for the for the uh, for the back of the book which is lovely of her um so I teamed up with them they're not charging anything you know they're, they're just saying okay well you know but that's fine you know but they just want to facilitate astrology so they were a natural partner those are great resources to go into a little more in depth with how you present the information in your book, I really liked how you brought it back to the one or oneness. Then you break it down into the two, just like the yin and the yang, which is the logo here at New Thinking Aloud, our rainbow yin yang. And then you describe the zodiac signs from that. Can you share a little bit about how those zodiac signs break down from the one and also how they all are represented by an element. Yeah, sure. So uh, the, the monad, as it's called, or the oneness, or, or the uh, singularity, um, breaking into two. Um, yin, yang, like you say, masculine, feminine in astrology. Um, it's it's quite interesting, this, this just, you know, this two things coming out of the one. I was thinking about it earlier, actually, um, because we have mythology talking about the sky father and the earth mother or the, the, the sky mother and the earth father. And, and, and these were the ways that those people um, said exactly what we're saying now, yin and yang. Um, it, it is all about a father type of figure, a mother type of figure. Um, and how those two come together to make one or when we're looking at breaking that down so we can get more information on a lower level of, or a higher level depending if you want to go that way or that way or that way <laughs> so there's no pejorative you know direction um then um yeah so getting the two um and from that too to be able to then say okay well then we want to be looking at elements now the elements were very much the idea of the greeks i think they sort of championed elements as as being the way to look at different energies um to, to look at the hot fiery um energy <laughs> of fire um, and to look at the dank, cold, moist earth, etc. Um, so then dividing that up into a, a first zodiac sign, a middle zodiac sign and a higher zodiac sign kind of comes naturally because it, it gives the levels that we need or the complexity that we need to interpret. Um, if everybody was just um a mixture of earth fire air and water with no further information no further complexity then we wouldn't really be doing justice to the human complexity to to, to the human being 
um, having so much more nuance than that. I think that's everything. I think I think that division and division and division gives us the absolute description of cosmos. Um, and we could say that deity is the whole thing down to the zodiac signs or we could say well deity is above all that but this is the structure of life um you know that that stuff is all open for debate and it's been debated for seven thousand years and we're not going to decide that now um but as, as long as we get something helpful which is going to give us the absolute distinct tool you know, the one thing that describes everything. This is like looking for the for the standard formula in, in physics, you know, that standard model. We've got the standard model. I feel sorry for the scientists that, you know, in physics that are still looking for theirs because things don't match up. Gravity does not match up um, with other forces. Um, and so they're left with this, this mess which they're struggling to understand in terms of this is how and why it all functions. Well, astrologers, we're so fortunate, we have it. We have been working on it for six, 7,000 years. Um, it has been perfected. Mm -hmm. um, you've decided it wasn't going to work, but OK, that's fine if you decide that. Um, we, we've got a working model here, a working standard model. And it seems to be able to take on any change whatsoever so even when we get well we know life is changing <laughs> it is everybody knows that um but when we get new things coming in um so we when we're talking to aliens um and you know the expansion of our minds you know maybe we'll get to the point where we can sort of astral travel or whatever astrology still has a model that works for all of that um, and and so therefore, I, I think we're lucky in as much as the forefathers, if you like, did the work and left us the model. Great. Thank you. <laughs> so as it's broken down from the oneness, there's the yin and the yang. There are the feminine and masculine qualities. And each zodiac sign is governed by a feminine or masculine sign. So, for example, the fire signs are more masculine and the earth are more feminine and then there's those qualities are even broken down further so once we understand the feminine or masculine quality and what the element is connected to the feminine or masculine quality then we know what that zodiac sign represents, we can look in our chart where that sign is in the house. When we understand what each of those houses represent, one might be how you show up in the world, how people perceive you in the first house, or how you tend to be intimate, bond, or go through deep transformation in the eighth house, and so forth. You then can apply those zodiac signs and understand yourself more. Yeah. That's it. So but that's it. You need to become an astrologer now. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I actually have been studying it for a number of years, and I do sometimes use it in uh, sessions with clients myself. I have found it to be incredibly helpful uh, to re for understanding uh, people much more deeply, and and for us to also like you say, to have more meaning and understanding and, and know our purpose and so forth, but also so that we can be more kind to ourselves and more compassionate and to others as well, because these influences do, uh, they do work on us. And that's also something I would like to ask you as well is when we look at astrology, some people say, well, just live your life. Why do you need to look at this chart? What What is that going to do for you? And then it does, of course, beg the perennial question of how much free will do we have versus destiny or how much does this dictate our karma when we when we look at that because we could just say well this is just the way i am versus making other choices for example yes good point 
I, when I'm asked this, I always say I think we've got about 20 percent free will. Um, and that's just a wild estimate by myself. Um, but I, I see it at work in the following way. And I think this is one of the reasons that astrology works, because it has this built in system to it. The symbols can be a variety of different things. This is just like the hieroglyphs in Egypt. Um, so uh, so um, I was just about to talk about a planet. I thought I better not talk about a planet. We can do that in a moment, or you can talk about a planet if you want. But I do want we want we'll circle back to those too. Yeah. So I'm all right. I'm going to talk about Mercury. Okay. So there's a symbol in astrology, Mercury. So these are the things that Mercury represents, right? Siblings, short journeys, education, learning. Now, okay, that's just a few of them. The the metal Mercury. Um, what else have we got? Communication. Communication, yes. Uh, news, things that we notice. We notice things with our, our Mercury. Okay, and that's quite a wide range of things, really, isn't it? Um, and I've deliberately picked Mercury. I always do because it has this really vast range of stuff, which is a typical Gemini, bit of this, bit of that, bit of the other. In that, there is the potential to use it for this reason not that reason I'll, I'll, I'll explain so say um in somebody is uh let's say we're forecasting doing prediction um and somebody is wanting to know um what it means that the mercury in their chart or mercury up there is going to make an influence on their chart and what does that mean for tomorrow so i could say well you're either going to see a sibling or you're going on a short journey or you're going to research something on the Internet. Let's just take those three. Now. If that client says, oh, that's funny, I'm seeing my brother tomorrow. Or if that client says, but I've got no siblings. Oh, but I was I was uh, thinking of going for a walk with my neighbor. Um, or um, if the client says, ah, oh, I'm at college tomorrow. I spend the whole day doing research. So it, it, there is a, some leeway or some padding in there which allows the planet to choose one thing over another. But it still has to be in the ballpark. <laughs> it still has to be one of those things. It can't be outside of those things. Yeah. That's an oversimplification. But... It is possible for astrology to, there's another condition that astrology can allow. So let's say, I'll, I'll talk about a planet again. So let's say um, a planet represents this. The planet can, we could take this from the planet, that side, or the other side. The planet represents the subject or whatever it is. Let's say money, Venus. And it can either be given or taken away. The planets will reward or they will withhold. So that's another way that we've got this potential for you to be given money or to find, oh, I've just opened my purse and I've got no money. Um, now, that, I think, allows for things to be you know, it could be this, it could be that, it could be the other. It's not too rigid. Mm -hmm. In psychology, when we're looking at zodiac signs um, and we're going very deep into complexity to understand the working, the inner workings of a human, um, we don't need um, to have this boundary um, which says I'm either going to be um, going to college or walking with a neighbour or seeing my brother. We don't need that boundary. We just need to be roughly in the area and talk about how it blurs with something else or it isn't quite as strong as another big pull in the chart. So in that way, it, it's um, it, it's much much easier to to say well we have issues about um 
sleeping in the dark <laughs> I've just picked something but th there's a lot of work which we can look at around that uh, so that flexibility was already built in with the sleeping in the dark issue once a person understands their birth chart there's also like you mentioned the transits there so the birth chart is really a snapshot of the cosmos or where we were on the earth in relationship to the zodiac belt then there is the real life movement of the universe of the solar system so then we were just mentioned prediction astrology then a person can look at well how are the planets influencing my chart either from the past or going forward as well yeah to do predictive work we need planets mm -hmm. okay so the planets do have value <laughs> yeah yeah um this is it i don't want to take anything away from the fact that you could only do a limited amount of things with this book the easy way to learn astrology the potential of the book is down to the fact that you've got a foothold right you're you're giving an entry way into it it's, it's an entry that's right walking into a garden versus um feeling i don't know what analogy would be but you're you're giving an entryway into um strolling through the garden versus being overwhelmed by a, a lot of information and not entering it yeah yeah that's that you, you you don't enter the garden because you, you just it's too confusing and you fear you might get lost yeah or this will take you so far into the garden and you'll do it with complete confidence okay i'll make a start mm -hmm. it is designed entirely for that to learn astrology now you are learning astrology what you've learned when you finish the book is astrology and you can read your birth chart yes but it's a vast subject um, and I am still learning astrology. <laughs> right. And there's so much to look at in somebody's chart, especially when you do add the planets in. For those listening who think, well, does it matter what my sun sign is? What do you say to those folks? It's part of it. Mm -hmm. It's Your sun sign is a part of it. But it is a vast subject. And the more of it you can take on, uh, the better the interpretation, um, work with a good astrologer, um, then the, the, the more is revealed. Because there's a sun sign, there's the moon sign, like you said, there's Mercury, Venus. So once a person understands the zodiac signs, the houses, then you can add the planets in, understanding what the planets are. So the, the, so the houses are where things happen in your life. The planets are the actions that can be taken, and then the zodiac signs are the qualities of how that can play out, or how would you describe that? That is a very good. <laughs> <laughs> Emmy, you are going to be a fabulous astrologer. <laughs> that, that, no, that's well said. Thank yeah, you. That makes sense. Once we add in the planets, what value do these planets bring because they also have the aspects, they play with each other. Sometimes they have harmonious or flowing aspects, and this is where we can have maybe gifts in our lives or natural abilities that we, some might say that we're just born with or that certain things we might be learning come more naturally or easy to us. And then there are the challenging aspects where we can have the more harsh or challenging angles with the planets as well. Yeah, that what they're doing is they're they're adding another layer. Uh, I think astrology astrology is best learnt in layers. Um, if you try to take on too much, it becomes soup. It's like a, trying to eat a bowl full of noodles all at once. Yeah, <laughs> I think the best thing to do is get the noodles out and line them all up, <laughs> and then <laughs> you can say, "Well, I'm only going to have I'll, I'll take ten noodles today." And I'll have 10 noodles tomorrow and I'll do the other 10 noodles another day. Um, great. You know, eventually you'll have had 30 noodles. Um, and uh, and that's that's cool. But um, I think it is best taken in small bites. Is there an astrology chart you would like to share with us today that could give us an example of how you 
read a birth chart? I th I think so actually um, because I I did check this method out on a few charts before before I put it into print, um, and I I think one that will be recognised on both sides of the Atlantic is is Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth II. So yeah, let's and let's just pick out a couple of things from her chart. What you'll notice first of all is that there are no planets, <laughs> so they've gone. And you'll notice the houses, all unequal houses, all different sizes, with the zodiac signs around them. Now, if you look at the middle of the chart, there's a thick line going across the middle. That is the horizon. Um, everything above that is the sky above your head. Everything below is the stuff on the other side of the earth. To the left of that horizon, you'll see the zodiac sign for Capricorn, or if you don't know what that is, you're looking at the zodiac sign for Capricorn. And if you look at the arrow, which is skewing off to the left, and it has a little arrow head on it in the chart, that's what we call the midheaven. So that is what people see. That is when, when this person is in the world, they see Scorpio. The line across the middle, um, the ascendant, is how that person views the world, um, the energy in which they greet the world. OK, so I think you'll agree that Capricorn on the ascendant for Queen Elizabeth very firmly describes her stoic, patient, very deliberate, very calm, placid, determined demeanour. And I think the Scorpio on the Midheaven describes how she did not want her family to have all of their private stuff displayed. Um, she was always very keen, um, and Scorpio um, is like this, to have that side of, of the family hidden. So there were parts of her that were hidden and we didn't see. So she used to go up to Balmoral in, in the summer and spend uh, some weeks with her family up there. There was no cameras allowed and nobody could take photographs of them. And it was said that that's when she felt truly relaxed. We could look at the, on her right-hand side, the line across the middle on the right-hand side, we've got the sign of cancer there. And so she would look to others to do the nurturing um, of the family. Um, so family members had to step in to nurture. Now, we know that when she took the role of queen, um, she had four children, but she at that stage, she wasn't, and at that time, she wasn't able to, to mother or nurture them herself. Um, she had was taken up entirely with, you know, the states of affairs and uh, her duties. And so, um, we do know that um, that side of her was probably mm, mm, capably filled um, by her husband, the Duke of Edinburgh. We can look down at the bottom of the chart and see that, that Taurus is at the bottom and we can say that she has um, a patient demeanour at home, that she likes simple things, she likes luxury, but she doesn't want to be too showy with it. And apparently this was so. So and I can go on. Right. So I look at the first house. We have Aquarius and we have Pisces in there. So she takes in a whole world um, with her, you know, just the very persona of her, the outside image of her, everything about her encompasses a large amount of experience. There you go. Yeah, and you just, thank you for that, Alison. You just shared a few pieces from her chart. And of course, like you said, you could keep going and get more and more information. And then what happens when the planets are added to these empty houses? Right, that's it. So then you get another layer. So what I'm encouraging students to do, or, or people starting on the journey, is first of all, learn this. And then put the planets in, because once those people get hold of those sexy old planets, 
they are not going to want to go back to this. This is this is sort of like bread and butter. Um, they want the marmalade or the jam <laughs> comes with the planets. And I'm saying, no, learn this first because it's easier. Get yourself some confidence. Feel comfortable reading, as I have just read. Um, and then add your planets. And then you're not missing half of the astrology for the rest of your astrological career. A lot of people don't even know how to do what I've just done because they've forgotten it. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. It really illustrates what we've been discussing. And how much do you feel the houses are weighted compared to the planets, or do they just interplay together in a beautiful orchestra? I, I guess I'd have to give a third to, to the three different layers. I'd have to give a third to the zodiac signs, third to the houses, third to the planets, if, if pushed to give an answer to that. Um and each gives something different. Um, people are just used to hearing about planets, looking at planets. And I, I think that gives them some superficiality in their astrology because they're only taking that one thing. Now, uh, what I'm talking about here now is natal astrology, reading a birth chart. I'm not talking about reading the daily transits, the daily planets, because that requires that you only look at those in the zodiac signs. The zodiac signs are needed through every single astrology, but the planets and the houses are really, you. so if you have the planets, you're looking at something that's happening right now on a daily basis. If you're looking at the houses, you're looking at a snapshot of something that happened 24 years ago and examining how that effect is still being held and worked with by that single organism, that person who was born on that space at that time. The planets can't give you that. Well, Alison, you've shared so much with us today and I'm really looking forward to your next book on the planets. Is there anything else you want to share about this easy way to read your own astrological birth chart today. I would love people to to join the the Facebook page. Um, so I have started a, a Facebook page entitled "The Easy Way to Learn Astrology." <laughs> so it won't be too difficult to find. Um, and also um, on YouTube, on my channel on YouTube. Um, it, there is a folder now entitled "The Easy Way to Learn Astrology," and so. Every week when I record a video, which covers a little bit more of the book, um, it's half an hour each week, a little bit more, a little bit more. Um, it just adds really to the book so that, you know, you can put the two things together. Then you can go onto the Facebook page and see that video there. You can go onto my YouTube channel and you can see it there. Um, and this is and then you can go to astro.com and get your chart run off and all the rest of it. So take the whole thing all three um and it doesn't cost anything once you've paid for the book <laughs> it's only 13 pounds anyway um then the rest is free um i would say do it because even if you don't believe in it you should study it before you make your mind up <laughs> because you're not really applying the science of science if you decide before you've even done the research so um, and I would like to thank you, who has been one of the most thoroughly researched people, very knowledgeable, asking very good questions, didn't once say to me, do you believe in this stuff? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Uh, for, you've been a delightful host and it's been a pleasure. Wow. Thank you, Alison. Well, it is so fun to talk with you and it's clear that you <laughs> you do. <laughs> believe in it, understand it very well, and have helped a lot of people. And I, I know you've helped a lot of people here today as well. Thank you so much for being with me today. Thank you very much. Lovely to talk to you. Wonderful. And I look forward to our next conversation in the future as well, and to have you back on New Thinking Aloud. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. You are the reason that we are here. <music> Book 2 
in the New Thinking Aloud Dialogues book series is a tribute to parapsychologist Russell Targ celebrating his 90th birthday. You can now download a PDF copy or order a beautiful printed copy of Issue 6 of the new Thinking Aloud magazine.